Hey everyone, my name is Mike Vaughn. I'm a writer for Geek Vibes Nation. I'm also the author of The Ultimate Guide to Strange Cinema. And I'm Dylan Gonzalez. I'm the editorial director for GeekVibesNation.com and also a co-host of the Home Dance Film Festival podcast. And welcome to a new Video Attic New Release Roundup. If you're new here, welcome. Uh, what we do is we take turns going back and forth talking about the latest home video releases, um, the good, the bad, uh, the ugly, but we always have a really good time talking about them and sharing them with you. And uh, with that, I'm going to let you start this party off. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very excited about my first release. Um, I always love when we get to introduce a new label uh, to our series. Um, and this is a well-established label, but this is the first releases that they are uh, coming to the U.S. finally after dazzling people for years overseas and people importing this is first domestic releases um so my first one i'm going to talk about from eureka entertainment is a uh, black mask uh mm. with jet lee um from the 90s uh this is a movie i've always been very interested in and uh here's the artwork underneath but i'd never gotten a chance to see it and i this was the ideal way to see it this is a two disc release here um and this they're very much kind of like in the vein of like arrow where they have like really nice packaging and robust uh uh special features and stuff there's no real uh artwork it's just a black artwork underneath um with a little bit of picture over here um and then you get a nice booklet here uh with essays and all that good stuff in here um but before i get deep into the package um i'll just say uh for the movie itself uh i quite enjoyed it it's a pretty good like hong kong action film um it's jet lee and one of his like highlight roles from the 90s where he plays he's a uh, a member of this uh, like a uh, super soldier project where all of these uh all these uh men were genetically modified so like basically detach their nervous system so they couldn't feel any pain so it's like kind of this project where it's like these people who are impervious to pain and then they can do all this crazy shit he kind of gets out of that life right at the beginning of the film and he's like going trying to live a normal life as like a librarian and like uh he like has all his eccentric co-workers and stuff but until some of his old colleagues come back and start creating a ruckus and he kind of has to get back into that life as this vigilante uh, who dons a mask and calls himself Black Mask. Um, and it's your typical action film. There's like a some like comedic figures throughout. There's like a damsel in distress type uh, woman who is also played up for laughs sometimes, but also kind of is played for like a love interest um but just mostly it's a lot of really great action set pieces some that go into more kind of like a sci-fi bent but it's kept pretty grounded in terms of like this genre um but there is a lot of hardcore action set pieces that are really impressive um because especially since it's Jet Li you know kind of like Jackie Chan he's doing a lot of his own stunts um, and they're very visceral and there's a lot of good filmmaking within this. So I quite, I thought it was a pretty entertaining film. Um, this new release uh, comes with several versions of the film. There's the original uncut uh, Hong Kong version, which uh, the verbiage in the press release says this is the first time it's been released on home video, I think. Um, so you get to see the fully uncut version for the first time. There's the US cut of the movie. Those are both on the first disc. And then ter in terms of the limited edition nature of this, there's a second disc, which has a Taiwanese cut, which has some unique footage. And then there is a fourth cut uh, that includes all of the unique footage from all of these cuts blended into one full cut of the movie. For those who, it's kind of more of a curiosity than just like a fully functional movie. But um, you do have that if you want to like have all the footage into one movie, you have that if you get this limited edition with the extra disc these uh come from new 2k restorations uh, i think they were conducted uh on behalf of fortune star um this isn't like a uh immaculate uh presentation but it looks very nice it's like you see some little deficiencies like in terms of like little nicks here and there 
or maybe a little bit of like verging on Black Crush in a few scenes. But overall, it's a very, very good uh, transfer. It's very solid. And it's probably the best. I would assume it's the best it's ever looked probably since the theatrical run, if not better. In terms of audio, there are a ton of different options for each cut. There's like the original language, there's the English uh, dubs, there's like 5.1, 2.0. There's like You get a lot of options per cut of the film. So there's a lot of different things that I, if you want to know in depth, you can look at my written review, which will probably be um, published within a few days of this video going live. There's also quite a few special features. There's a commentary track for each version of the film, of the first disc of the film. So the Hong Kong cut is a one from Frank Jing, and the U.S. theatrical cut is um, Arn Verna and Mike Leader, I believe, um, who they're action film historians, and they've done a lot of like martial arts films that I've covered. Um, there are also various interviews that are uh, quite in depth, um, and just some like marketing materials and stuff. So if you're a Jet Li fan or a fan of Black Mask, this is the ideal presentation that that has been released. Um, and I'm glad that Eureka has made this jump into the U.S. market because uh, it, it can get pretty expensive importing all the time because they have such impressive releases and there's a lot of really great stuff on the horizon. So this was a good first uh, entry for me for Eureka, and I'm very excited to dig into more, which I will be doing on my next title, which I'll talk, talk about in a little bit. But Black Mask is definitely worth a pickup. Nice. Um yeah, so my first title is also kind of like an action movie, so it pairs really well. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is uh, Warner Archives Money Talks. And mm -hmm. that is a uh, not a buddy cop movie, but it is sort of like in that vein with uh, Chris Tucker and Charlie Sheen. Um, and this is certainly, uh, this is Brett Ratner who. Um, I'm not going to say anything about him, but he is allegedly a very scummy person. You can look that up on your own. Um, but he basically is, as far as I know, sort of still in director jail. Um, but uh, I mention this because uh, this feels very much like a proto Rush Hour movie. It's a shame because I think what this movie lacks is what I like about at least the first Rush Hour movie, which is that chemistry. And mm -hmm. as much as the two actors are really trying, I'm not, it, it's, I'm not getting the chemistry. I'm not getting that kind of vibe, um, which really hurts the movie, I think. But it has some decent comedy in it. It has a couple very cringe moments, uh, definitely humor that hasn't aged particularly well. I love the supporting cast. Um, Paul Servino is like, I guess pretty stereotypical as like, a gangster mobster but like he's so great but uh yeah i don't know there's some also uh some really good action set pieces uh i love the finale and how it just escalates and gets crazier and crazier to like you know someone's got like a bazooka and uh they're like shooting each other from a stadium it's i don't know it's fun um but it's just not like the Rush Hour movies. It just doesn't have that kind of chemistry. But you can see him kind of working out the kinks from this to um, that movie. So, uh, I mean, it's like 96 minutes. Like the pacing is actually really good as well. Uh, even if everything doesn't land exceptionally well, it still is just a really fast paced, enjoyable enough time. Yeah, as far as it looks, again, no complaints. Uh, with Warner Archive. Uh, it looks fairly nice for the most part. Sounds good. There's no extras, unfortunately. Um, typically, only the like real older movies get any sort of like bonus stuff. And then it's got to be really good for them to do like extra stuff, like new stuff. But mm -hmm. yeah, if you just want the movie looking really good, uh, Money Talks, um, it's okay. It's very much trying to be like a 48 hours, but you just don't have that like chemistry you don't have that like i don't know i don't even think the writing is as good as say like a rush hour but you can kind of see where you know he was trying to elevate that into what he would later do so it's it's all right i've always wanted to see this i was always really curious about this so i'm glad that, that this has a blu-ray release 
Yeah, absolutely. That's one that uh, I like the performers and I know I need to see it, even if I'm going to keep my expectations kind of below. Um, but I'm glad at least Warner Archive put it out because I know that they put at least a good amount of care into the transfer. So that's that's what I care about most. Um, my next title um, is another, like I said, from Eureka. This is from their Masters of Cinema collection. And this is... I believe it's 1927, yeah, 1927 film, The Cat in the Canary, uh, which is a uh, old dark house film, uh, which inspired a lot of the best and most prominent old dark house films. Uh, but I'll kind of dig into that in a little bit. Um, so here is a, this is a one disc release, uh, but it has a, uh, a booklet which I'll share here and there is a reversible cover art which I'll do real quick here so this is a silent film and I like this reversible cover art pretty well too so I'll probably keep it like that and have the slip cover um, and as I just kind of showed off here is the booklet so you get uh transfer notes and essays and all kinds of stuff within here. Uh, so yeah, here's like an example of the essays. Anyone who's watched any kind of old Dark House movie will uh, recognize some of the familiar narrative stroke 20 years after the death of this like rich, like family patriarch. Um, his will is finally going to be read to the family and uh all, so everyone gathers in this house and he ends up in this will leaving everything to like his niece who's like in her 20s she, he's going to leave everything with the stipulation of uh, if she's of sound mind which leads to kind of like uh some circumstances where she is kind of plagued by different like occurrences around the house and at the same time there is like an escaped kind of mental patient like uh, like down the road or whatever that's apparently on the grounds so there's like they're dealing with that um so it's just kind of a tale of this woman kind of being terrorized by either actual things that she should be afraid of or people trying to bilk her out of her potential inheritance and there's a nice amount of like dark comedy and some kind of more thrilling moments or some good make makeup special effects work i i like kind of like this character here it's like kind of like all done up kind of like a cat um so it's kind of that old formula which would be adapted um a few years later in the old dark house and then again with future adaptations of that story but um the cat and the canary it's it's a fun silent era film and it's it moves at a really good pace it's not overly long it's just under 90 minutes uh, it's 86 minutes long and it keeps up a good pace. Uh, I, yeah, I quite liked it. It's a really well-told story, kept my attention. I know some people with silent era films, it, they can have a little bit of a disconnect because they don't have dialogue to kind of fall back on and they may not engage with things as much. But if you're looking for more of like an entry into silent era, I think this is a pretty solid one because it's, it's a very snappy narrative and it keeps you entertained. In terms of this presentation, this is from a new 4K restoration prepared by MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art from the original camera negatives. So a lot of times they don't have a lot of these original negatives for films this old. They did with this one and this restoration is very nice. It's a really beautiful transfer. Even like for what I expect from like silent era films uh, on Blu-ray these days, this is even better I feel just because I did not see a lot of variance in some of the material and just a lot of things I usually can kind of forgive. I, they weren't even present on this presentation. So it's a really, really nice transfer. Um, and the audio track, uh, the score that is provided for this um, also sounds really nice. I believe there's a 5.1 track for that and it sounds really nice and robust. Good number of special features. Um, there are two commentary tracks, a video essay, a couple different interviews and some other kind of random marketing material as well. So if you like old dark house films, The Cat and the Canary is a good silent era version of one. And it's a really nice release from Eureka that I think people will be pretty pleased with. Nice. Yeah, no, I like, I love all those old dark house movies. Um, it's unfortunate because if you've seen one, you've kind of seen them all. So you have this sort of like the, it's supernatural, but it's not. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, that sounds cool. And um, 
I think that's awesome that we have a really nice restoration of that. My next one is another Warner Archive title, but I'm very much more into this one. So this one is uh, They Drive by Night. And this one does have um, an array of special features. They're mostly uh, like radio broadcasts, but then there is a really nice uh, featurette about the story of They Drive By Night, which I think is a really uh, cool bonus feature. And I believe that's a port over from the DVD. But yeah, so this one was interesting. Um, I had heard of it, but I'd never had seen it before. So the movie kind of starts as this sort of very humdrum day in the life of truck drivers. But the dialogue was snappy enough and the acting is is really good. So it's it's really engaging. But then in like... I think it's about the hour mark. It morphs into this sort of like hard boiled noir. And it's well written enough that it doesn't feel like it didn't lay the ground for that. It it does. Um, but it certainly is like slightly jarring. Um, I think again, it's just a testament to the really good writing where it made that transition not feel too whiplash or like too tonally disconnected. And then it kind of, then it kind of uh, shifts again into a court drama. And <laughs> like, then it also kind of weaves in like a psycho plot. I mean, it's, it's kind of wild. Um, have you had a chance to see this one yet? No, there's only one Warner Archive March title I've been able to check out, and okay. you'll be talking about it a little bit later, uh, but not this one yet. Okay, <laughs> nice little uh, tease for, for later, but mm -hmm. yeah, so, it. but again, like, I just can't get over how well this is written, like, the dialogue, just very snappy, very witty, but it doesn't feel overwritten or, like, trying to be maybe a little bit too clever for its own good. I mean, it's not a perfect film. Again, I feel like as much as the lead-in uh, for these twists sort of works, it definitely feels like I wish this stuff would have been introduced way sooner if I like had to sort of, you know, give a uh, critique. But also, it just does throw a lot at you. Like, I didn't even mention the subplot with, like, Humphrey Bogart having an accident and the the sort of fallout from that george raff i i'm not a huge fan of um there is a rumor that he was supposed to be in double indemnity but thankfully was not cast in that and i think his like main thing was like he was old time gangster movie heavies and that was kind of the extent of his range <laughs> that sounds shitty but whatever and then humphrey bogart is in it of course Raft is more of the leading man in this, which is funny because they don't really give Bogart a lot to do. Like they, they do give him some like really meaty dramatic scenes. There's a really good monologue he has at the dinner table, which when you see it, you'll understand. But like he, um, he almost plays second fiddle, and it's so funny to see that. Like he is isn't really in his like detective sort of like was like Sam Spade kind of era yet. So. That's kind of interesting. Um, the movie is only 95 minutes long. It clips along at a really nice pace. Um, this feels like a really lived in world and seeing sort of like truckers and how they dealt with stuff back in the day was interesting. There is a really funny scene. It's funny, but it's kind of jarring. It's a scene where George Raff and, and Humphrey Bogart is like dodging the, this collector, uh, debt collector. And, you know, the, this it's like this guy, he's like that, like, little weaselly, like, I want to get my money kind of guy. And, like, they hide this guy, these guys in this, like, diner. And these two, like, random guys are like, I don't like collectors. So they literally heave-ho him out of the diner. And I mention this only because it's, like, a really interesting sort of byproduct of, like, the Great Depression and, like, people trying to just help each other and... Even if like that guy totally was in the right because they did owe him money, but I don't know. Yeah, good movie. Uh, looks really great as well. Not bare bones, which is always really nice to see. Um, so yeah, really good release. If you haven't seen this one, um, the title doesn't sound that exciting, but it's it's pretty good. And I haven't mentioned Ida Lupino, and she is amazing as always. Like she steals every scene she's in. 
I know we both really love her stuff. Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, it's really good. Uh, check it out. Yeah, that one's been highly requested for years, and I've, I'm curious to finally check it out because everyone's spoken so highly about it. So I'm really looking forward to that one. I'm glad that the release is also good, but I would expect that from Warner Archive. Um, my next title, I was very hesitant about because I I'm, I try to be careful about what I, I request because I, I know what I like and what I don't like. And I don't really like hardcore, like, sexual exploitation pictures but i took a chance on this because i believe in fun city editions and i i trust their taste and this one actually worked out for me um this has two titles and i'll show both uh it's a reversible uh slip cover so um we have uh deep in the heart aka handgun uh so in the u.s it was called deep in the heart and the uk is called handgun because i guess they wouldn't understand like deep in the heart of texas like that type of uh, yeah so so yeah this takes place in texas but it's funny because it's made uh, by a guy from uh the uk so it's kind of his interpretation of like american uh lifestyle and this this also has a reversible uh cover art inside which i'll show off so i showed you the deep in the heart uh slide and here's the handgun side here so this is kind of your your typical uh rape revenge tale but told in like a pretty interesting way um it doesn't get too much in the exploitation arena which i appreciate this does have like uh essays and stuff within here uh which are worth checking out um, this involves a a uh, a woman from Bo- who moves from Boston to Texas. She's a school teacher, and she's kind of like she's new in town. She's trying to get to know the locals and kind of get into the vibe of the city and make friends and stuff. And she ends up getting kind of connected with this man who he's a Texan and he's he's a very intense personality. He's like really into guns and like, he's really proud of being from Texas. And there's a scene at the beginning, this isn't a spoiler at all, but um, where this would never fly today because he kind of gets himself invited into her classroom to fill in the gaps of some Texas history about Samuel Colt of like the Colt uh, revolver. And he like brings in a gun to like show, like show it off and stuff and show him like all about this gun and stuff. I was like, this is wild. Like you would, this would not fly at all today. <laughs> but um, despite her kind of like, she kind of goes along with on some dates with him, despite kind of being not super into him. Until one night, um, he convinces her to come over, and she ends up getting raped by gunpoint. Um, but it's not super explicit, but it's very unsettling, and it, it does kind of like more of a fade to black than like lingering on the issues. But his reaction to things is very interesting. It's one of the things I am intrigued by, by this movie, because the way he tries to kind of gaslight her into things and kind of, um, he's not kind of like, no one will ever believe you or anything like that. Anything like that. He's just kind of like more so in his mind, he's doing her a favor and like letting her not be like so uptight and just trying to get her to like break out of her shell. So he's like, yeah, I'm helping her out. I'm like, yeah, we're just having fun. And just kind of how that, it, it's very unsettling the way it's like more of an interesting dynamic to me than more of like an overt bad guy he's just kind of a sociopath but in a different way but of course you're, you you got to kind of deal with the system that has been like set up with like whether or not you believe women and stuff in this situation and especially during this time which i believe this was the 80s or 70s um it shows kind of her dealing with like the medical establishment the police, the religious in, like institution, despite it never her really coming forward in a big way claiming she was raped. But what she chooses to do instead is takes up his his own hobby against him and like starts to take up guns and like getting really good with guns. And there's kind of this really interesting psychological cat and mouse game of like, he is around her while she is like getting really good with like handguns and stuff. And it's kind of like almost seeing the person who is almost like destined to kill you getting good at their profession. And it's like a really interesting dynamic that I really, it's one of the things I really appreciate about this movie and seeing her kind of get more comfortable with things and like getting even better than he is with guns. It's really interesting. Um, But I won't 
spoil how it eventually goes, but I I like this a lot more than I expected to because it doesn't lean into the exploitation aspects of things as much. Um, if you are into that, um, you might be a little bit disappointed, but if you like a more grounded revenge tale, I think it's really like more on the psychological t uh, side of things. And I think it, it works very well. Um, this from Fun City Edition comes from a new 4K restoration um, of the original camera, 35 millimeter original camera negative. It looks very nice. It's been really uh, nicely restored. Pretty much everything I get from Fun City Editions is really amazing. Um, and I, I think it looks uh, really nice. Um, it does come with a new commentary track um, and like a very, very short uh, archival interview with the director. It's like two minutes long, just enough to him kind of like talk about the basics of the movie, but the commentary track's pretty good and gives you a little bit of context to this movie. So. Um, if it sounds interesting to you, Deep in the Heart, aka Handgun, is worth checking out. Um, and make sure buy early if you want like this nice slipcover, because um, I'm I think future pressings probably will drop it. And I really like kind of the quality of that slipcover. Nice. Um, Edgar Allan Poe also likes that, so he's nice. excited. Um, so my next title is. Um, it's so funny because I saw the parody of this before I actually saw the real movie. And I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit, but it's stand. Uh, the... I know what this is. I knew it. I knew it. Is this the one you've South, seen? South Park. Yeah. yeah. And yes, it, it is the one I watched this week. Um, yeah, so uh, no bonus. Well, there's a trailer. If you count that as bonus yeah. feature, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Um, so this was um, really funny because like you were saying, South Park did um, do uh, a parody of this. Cartman was essentially the um, teacher, like he had the slick back hair, uh, or like the um, like the comb over, I guess. Uh, Edward G. Um, or oh my God, I said Edward Edward G. Robinson, Edward James, almost. And I'm not gonna do the voice, um, but you can look it up on YouTube if you want. <laughs> I'll do it. How do I reach these beads? <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, My wife and I kept doing that before <laughs> watching the movie. Uh, yeah, I did that a lot. My husband was like, please stop. Um, <laughs> so I was like, all right, you're no fun. But um, <laughs> my, my last name's Gonzalez, so I can do it. <laughs> right. I'm going to, yeah, I was yeah. going to say, I'll let, I'll let you do it. But yeah, I, mm -hmm. I like this one. It It's like, I'm, I, it's funny. I really like, um, this this sort of genre, which is like teaching uh, kids that, uh, for one reason or another, people think are like unteachable or irredeemable in some way, um, maybe based on race or economical status, both. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just a sucker for those movies. I think like it's a genre that goes back like a long time, um, probably longer than a lot of people think, but. Um, yeah, I like how this is more specifically like, let's get into calculus of all things. <laughs> Whereas most of these movies are like, I'm just want I just want to teach you so you can like get out of this neighborhood. And it's not that like this isn't that, it is, but it's like I like how it's more kind of focused on everybody sort of pulling together as a team, these kids. And I, I mean, I like how like some of the kids call out the teacher on some of his bullshit. Like, I'm sorry for forgetting her character's name, but she's like, I'm sick of you using me as a, a punchline joking about her like appearance or her like things she does and stuff. And it's like, yeah, he's like fucking wrong for that. And I'm glad that she called him out and he kind of realizes that, yeah, like he is wrong with some of the ways he jokes and tries to interact with the kids i mean there's definitely stuff that i'm like wow you could never get away with this as a teacher now like there's like yeah. no way <laughs> like some of the stuff he says things he does but um yeah that's just the byproduct of these these movies they all try to sort of relate to the kids on their level or meet them some somehow but um yeah it's good it's fun um i don't know if fun's the right word but it was enjoyable um I don't know if it quite reached the emotional heights of like maybe some of these other movies, but uh, I liked it. It's so funny also because even though like Lou Diamond Phillip is like second build here, like he's barely, it, he feels like he's barely in the movie. Like, did you know, did you feel like that too? I mean, 
he's uh, not I mean I think he yeah I think he was pretty in the mood be uh, in comparison to the other kids I think he was right up there with some of the yeah. most featured ones I know he's the one featured on the cover art so mm-hmm. you would think maybe he'd be in there a little bit more but I think he's pretty well yeah, featured like he's like I mean he's the main thing even besides like <laughs> the teacher character so i don't know no i'm not complaining i like i liked his character i love him in like everything he does i think he's such a fascinating actor um are any of these other actors like kind of famous or like became famous because they nobody really looked familiar to me at least not to my knowledge not to my knowledge but i mean i have to say everybody felt super authentic like watching it i i you feel like this is like a classroom in the 80s and these are aren't like celebrities or stars or future stars they just feel like real kids um and that's the thing like i don't know how old some of these people were but like it, it always bothers me where it's like high school students but they're like they're clearly like in their 20s and maybe early 30s and i'm like come on but the yeah again everyone feels very like much like they're actually in high school so it's really good it looks really good as well sounds good um just a trailer unfortunately um it would have been nice to have like an, maybe some archival stuff maybe probably nothing new did edward james almost died right not so long ago i i don't think so did he I, I thought I, he did. I don't remember him. Well, yeah, I didn't just like jinx it. And, like now he's Jesus. I, thought I he... don't think he did. Oh, okay. Well, I apologize. Uh, he's not dead. <laughs> um, I could swear I he was, but anyway. Uh, yeah, stand and deliver. Um, pretty good. It isn't one of my favorite movies of this kind, but like I really did like it. I thought the cheating angle was interesting and. Oh my gosh. Uh Andy Garcia's in it for like a little bit too. It's like one of like the I guess I don't remember what his official title was, but he was like investigating cheating or whatever. So he like, like che- works for the city like school board or something. <laughs> to police or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, really good. Um performances were great. Um, it was really excellently shot as well. And uh yeah, if you haven't seen this movie and you kind of like stuff like Blackboard Jungle and oh my God, my my mind is going. The one with uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. Oh, Dangerous Minds. Yeah, mm-hmm. where you know she's a cool teacher because she sits the wrong mm-hmm. way. Um, but if Absolutely. you like this, yeah. But if you like those movies, uh, check this one out as. Well. Absolutely. Um, a few words on Stand and Deliver. One thing my my wife discovered whenever we were watching this, she looked it up. Um. Lou, Di- Lou Diamond Phillips is Filipino uh, and not Mexican, so that's a little like, I think like Asian and like Hispanic. But um, so that, that that was interesting, an interesting choice, I guess. I guess they couldn't find like a authentically Mexican actor to go with things, but oh well. Um, and my other thing, um, in, in regards to the um his things that he says in class like i was really looking forward to this movie but i had totally forgotten like i'd seen this in pieces before but i had totally forgotten like some of the weird shit he says so like the first time whenever he's like talking to like the little quiet girl and stuff and he like right before he leaves her desk he's like is it true that quiet girls are better oh, than right? i was like what the fuck is this yeah that was that was pretty creepy um, I was like, no, Edward James almost. You can't do this. You're supposed to be an inspirational teacher, not saying weird pervy shit to the kids. And like, she particularly looks young too, which was like <laughs> made it even more upsetting. Yeah, if you, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm not justifying that. It's just, it's definitely like stuff that's very cringy. But yeah, it's like stuff that would most definitely get him fired. Um, <laughs> yeah. I was just like, what is this movie? It's supposed to be an inspirational teacher thing. And you say all kinds of misogynistic shit. This is wild. Uh, but other than that, pretty good movie. <laughs> um, my next title um, is from MB- MBD Entertainment from the Rewind Collection. Um, it is Mean Guns uh, with Christopher Lambert and Ice-T. Uh, it is... Um, 
directed by Albert Pune, who did like Cyborg and other action favorites, favorites. Uh, uh, if you're an action fan, uh, you might classify them as favorites. Um, here's your typical like uh, design here. You get a fold out, but, well, you get a reversible cover art that looks just, uh, I showed off the other side, but that's the like the slip cover. And then the other side is like this. And then you get the fold out, uh, fold out poster that has the newer artwork uh, on here. It's a little bit smaller than some, but it's it's a pretty decent size. Um, so no booklets or anything, just the poster. But uh, this film, it's pretty good in terms of like kind of mindless '90s action. Um, I reviewed another Ice T film a few weeks ago. Um, this is. I like Ice T better in this role because I guess he's able to play up a little bit more to kind of like an over the top cheesy element more than kind of more the grounded dramatic element of like surviving the game. Um, here he plays kind of like the lead of this crime syndicate that invites all like the world's baddest criminals to this like prison that's about, about to open up. And he like forces them into a game where like they have to all try to survive the night and like kill each other. And if they like the three that survive gets like $10 million each. And basically like one person's like, what if I don't want to do this? And he just gets shot. So it's like, okay, they're kind of forced to do this. Uh, but it's just kind of, it's a very simple premise. It's just a bunch of criminals in one space faced with this like uh, objective where like, kill or be killed and like allegiances are tested and people turn on each other who were once friends and you're just kind of all there are like different alliances formed to try to like survive the night and all this kind of stuff and then there's also some other like people who are there for their own reasons of like revenge that you get you kind of learn throughout the picture and christopher lambert uh who from like highlander or mortal Kombat, um he is one of the main, he's our, like our, our main protagonist entryway into the story. And he's kind of like the real, the real badass of the group is like surviving all this shit and like doling out death and all this stuff. And you get to a little sprinkle of his backstory as well. Uh, but overall, pretty, it's a little bit messy. Um, it's fun, but it's just, it's not the best action film I've seen. If you kind of like, if you like the, the premise, it kind of fulfills what it sets out to do but it's not like amazing it's just kind of like some pretty decent action sequences narrative doesn't completely make sense at all times and you question some of the character motivations and some of the dialogue is very hokey or cheesy um but it gets the job done if you're looking for kind of like a cheese fest mindless action film so um this is the at least the north american um blu-ray debut it comes from an hd master that overall looks very nice but it seems like they didn't take care they maybe either just didn't give it a full restoration or they wanted to to maintain kind of like a throwback quality because a lot of times i would see kind of like the cigarette burns like with the like a film print whenever it changes and stuff so i was like oh they that's left and there's other kind of minor nicks and scratches here and there so if you want kind of like that really filmic feeling you get that but um some may want this to be a little bit more cleaned up than it is but overall it's a pretty solid presentation they also kind of talk about in the commentary track from albert pune kind of the aesthetic of this film which is really interesting i really gained a lot from what i listened to this commentary track because he actually talked about um getting the look of this film from seeing what they were doing on seven david fincher seven and he kind of talks about how like they would process the film before shooting it to kind of get like a different emulsion like presentation and how it was like so it gave kind of like this golden feel that they kind of were going for and he goes into it um pretty deep into the commentary track which was interesting so if you like kind of really technical film school detail type stuff like that the commentary track is really worth it without repute um, there's also a very brief introduction, like a 30-ish second introduction from that director. There's also three um, pretty uh, nice interviews that run from 19 to 29 minutes long with the producer, executive producer, and the composer. Um, and you also get some um, some interesting tea on some of like the uh, 
financial stuff with this movie because one of the people he like handled the money stuff and he kind of he drops some details about people's salaries which i was like oh interesting um so if you're interested in that kind of like hollywood hot guys you can listen to some of those interviews um uh you also get like some trailers and stuff uh but yeah overall so pretty good package if you're into this movie i think you'll be pretty happy with what mbd has done with it um yeah it's mindless action fun it's pretty good hmm um yeah that sounds interesting um not one i've heard of but um i love a good mindless action movie so i'm down so my next title is a thriller but i wouldn't say it's mindless um it is a little messy but we'll get into it um it is um uh, my not my final title but my final warner archive title um and that is the little drummer girl this is based on the novel of the same name and back there is a trailer uh that's it for uh special features um so this is a spy movie dealing with um diane keaton is an actor she is sort of manipulated into um spying and helping uh the the war um on palestine versus israel which is sadly still very relevant um which kind of like contagion was really eerie watching this now um and this was uh like in the 70s um so not that this stuff's been going on for like not a long time but it's just weird how some things really don't change but Primarily, it is a thriller. It's a political thriller, but it mainly tries to keep it kind of like it doesn't feel like it's pushing an agenda. But there is a a quote from the New York Times that I wanted to re read you because I think it sort of sums up how I feel about this. And it says, everyone connected with this film behaves as if they are hanging on to a tail of a tiger and can't let go. They desperately clutch the material, but never tame it. I think that, like I said, I think that sums it up really well because there's a lot of interesting moving parts, but I never feel like it totally comes together in a satisfying way. Like there are some really good set pieces. Uh, as far as thrillers go, there is like some really excellent moments, but I don't want to spoil them because it, it kind of is intricate to the plot. But yeah, um, Diane Keaton is always a win for me. I love her. It's also just wild, like the lengths that these this group goes to recruit her like for example at the beginning of the movie they set up a very elaborate fake wine commercial that she was cast in and this is all a ruse meaning like everybody filming it the other actors like everything this is all just to sort of bait her um and it doesn't feel too fantastical it feels like maybe that you know people would sort of go to these lengths but it also doesn't shy away from showing you like the real horrors of everything going on here like again kind of early on there is a like explosion but you sort of like meet the family there's like a kid and i mean it doesn't get too gratuitous like you don't really see what happens to them but obviously it explodes they're they're you know reduced to atoms and i think like it's just moments like that that I think is a smart way to sort of show you sort of like the human element uh, at play and maybe not the grander sort of chess that the rest of the movie is. Yeah, so it's interesting. I don't think it comes together fully for me, but um, Klaus Kinski is also in this, I should mention, and he is a madman. Uh, as always, mm -hmm. he's always entertaining to watch, but oh my gosh, I would, I know he's passed away, but like anybody that had to work with him like no it's just it's bad time <laughs> like when i talked to david schmuller who worked with him he was like i wanted to kill him i really did he obviously didn't do it but like it was just like it, it seemed very sincere like he he had an uh took a lot of his shit but it's fascinating to watch again this uh, warner archive looks really nice it's um color this time so we really do get a nice kind of pop in the colors visually um this movie is really well shot and again i think that like i appreciate that sort of like upgrade in detail this is uh two hours and 10 minutes long i noted that because i'm like oh my god this is so long 
And again, the pacing is a little off. So sometimes it goes by really quickly. Sometimes if it's as a slog, but um, overall, it's a decent movie. Check it out. If you like thrillers, this one might be uh, maybe a little lesser known one. Um, now I'm told there's a BBC miniseries that is much better that I do want to try to check out. But yeah, another really good Warner Archive uh, title and you should all check it out. Yeah, that was one I was mainly looking forward to because I like Diane Keaton and that seems like a little bit of a different role than I'm used to her in. So I was interested to check out what that was all about. So I really look forward to doing that soon. My next title is from uh, Unearthed Films. Uh, This is The Abandoned, uh, which I believe came out in 2006. (laughs) Uh, And... I had never heard of this film, but I thought it was quite interesting. Um, So no reversible cover art, just the disc in there. Um, This, uh, it starts out in the past, like 40 years ago in the past um, in Russia, and it shows um, a uh, a family that's like sitting at like the dinner table and all of a sudden this, this truck pulls up and uh, whenever the the leader of the house goes to the uh, un, like look in the side of the truck, he finds a dead woman and two alive babies. And it kind of jumps forward in time and um, you don't really know what happened ha- happened to this woman, how she got there or whatever, but you, you come to realize like these babies, they were like adopted and kind of like got away, they like, there's a mystery about where these babies actually come from um, until 40 years later, this, the one of the girl of the two babies, she's like, she's now 40 years old and she's like summoned back to Russia to kind of like take care of like kind of this estate stuff. Like she learns that she inherited this house. And even though she's been looking for her like parents for years, this kind of all of a sudden just manifests itself uh, without spoiling it too much. It, it's almost, it's like a haunted house tale but kind of in the vein of like a hill house or something where it's like a house that is like has unfinished business is like calling these kids back to the house like you got away from me but may, like maybe we have unfinished business with you and it, it it's a really interesting ghost tale because um it kind of messes with your perception of reality once she gets to the house because like things start happening but you don't like, is she hallucinating? Like, is she seeing visions of things that happen? She's seeing like visions of herself, but dead and stuff. There's all kinds of things going on within this house. It's really creepy. And it, it there's a lot of disturbing imagery in here, but it's very more so atmospheric and very uh, deliberately paced. It's, it doesn't assault you with scares, but it kind of builds things up pretty nicely. While there are some deficiencies in the screenplay where not all these things can make complete sense and you might be a little bit left underwhelmed in certain aspects. I think it's really good, like vibes for lack of a better word. Um, it's very, it's a really kind of chilling atmosphere to be within. Um, and overall, I think some of the scares are very effective and just like, it's more how kind of more visceral stuff interacts with this like psychological and how those two intermingle. I think is really, I, I like a good psychologically driven horror film um it's a little bit more my speed usually and i think this one worked pretty well even if there were something i didn't quite love overall i think it's a really uh, good discovery for me i know other people have seen it and they like seem to a little bit mixed on it some really like it some don't so it might be a little bit more of a polarizing uh picture but this is a good release from my my brief research um i didn't see that this had been released in north america on blu-ray before um, but the presentation is very nice. Uh, there's new three new interviews um, with the director and two of the co- co-screenwriters, which one of the co-screenwriters is very interesting, uh, Richard Stanley. Um, and these are very um, long interviews. Um, each one is about 50 minutes long. They're like 40, 45 to 52 minutes long new interviews. Um, and there's some very interesting things about the production and kind of like the different ideas that each of the writers had about the material and what they wanted to do. So if you see a little bit of messiness in the movie, you can probably goes back to some of the issues with the production and the screenplay and stuff. There's also a host of archival special features, like a making of and some different things. Several, like there's at least like three or four 
alternate endings, which might tell you something about the movie of just like, we don't know which one we're going to go with. So, um, but overall, it's a good presentation. Um, it's worth checking out if you're a horror fan, see where you fall on it. Um, yeah, overall, I thought it was a pretty good discovery. I wonder if films did a really good job with the Blu-ray. Nice. So it's funny that you say about um, this being like a really interesting release as far as like uh, in the U.S. Because my next title, um, I lied, actually. I'm sorry. I lied to y'all. I am not done with Warner Archive. Um, <laughs> so Cult 45, the complete series, is a Warner Archive uh, thing. But um, I haven't watched this. I, I'll, I'll also be honest and say I haven't watched this entire series yet. It's like 67 episodes. Um, but I did um, get like most of the way through this the first season. Let me show off the packaging here. So these are um how they do like the discs and yeah and uh yeah so as i say these um have been unavailable uh at least on blu-ray uh to the public um and uh it looks um i don't know if they've been on dvd it just says blu-ray um debut so i don't think they have i think i read that in the warner archive okay. thread on blu-ray that it's people are like oh this has been kind of out of circulation for a long time so it's kind of a bigger deal that this like hasn't okay. been out for a while nice um and it's also really funny because like the very first episode i think sets a really good table for like what this show is about um this guy is a gun salesman, but he actually is working undercover, looking for like bad guys. And he meets this like woman who's sort of like a moral crusader. And she's like, I think guns are awful, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, well, he literally says verbatim, like, cause I, I was like, I, it shocked me a little bit where he was like, guns don't kill people, people kill people. And I'm like, it's that, like I didn't realize that that argument was like all the way back in the fifties, and yeah, they and they say it in this too. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's it's wild. Like it's it's um has a really interesting um uh, guest cast. Um, Adam West, Leonard Nimoy, um, Angie Dickinson. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's like so far it's not so much about his character, but it's sort of like the bad guy of the week. But I'm like hoping as the series goes on, it fl flushes him out a little bit more as a character. Also, it's interesting because I was reading that at a certain point, they change actors. They, um, I guess, like could not negotiate a contract or something, or he wasn't happy with, some with something. But like, yeah, um, that's unfortunate. But so this is what, um, they all look like, and then you have the episode list. Um, and yeah, no, I think like, and I have to say, I was absolutely blown away by how good this looks. Like, stunning. Um, this says it's remastered from 4K scans of the original camera negative, and I'm like, wow. Like, right off the bat, like, everything looked just so crisp and clean and course like even these shows were like shot it like was sort of cut off like um 16 millimeter but it obviously wasn't it was like a 35 of some kind but yeah i mean just beautiful how they shot it and like the transfer is just absolutely gorgeous i mean again black and white not incredibly visually stunning but like the costumes like the production design the details and everything like really pop here i i can't stress enough how great this series looks like warner archive is just like always knocking it out of the park so um yeah i think that's cool i didn't realize that this was like this scarce of a of a um, film or a film this is based on a film though but uh i didn't realize it was like that scarce of a, a tv show and it's awesome it's all 67 episodes um, I'm really enjoying going through these, seeing some of these really interesting like character actors really just devour these roles. Um, so, yeah, um, Dan Blocker's in it. 
fucking love that. Um, so good. I definitely recommend it. Um, if you have somebody that's interested in like stuff like this, like, yeah, it's an absolute must. Yeah, I'm very excited to dig into that one. I am thrilled that Warner Archive is getting more into like older TV series as well. I mean, I'm I welcome all their TV series. There's a few that I wish they would kind of rescue on Blu-ray, but um overall I like to support their TV efforts as much as possible. And that sounds like a really, really cool one. And the fact that it hasn't been around for a while, it's even better. Um, my next title is from Kino Classics. Um and this is uh, The Wind of Ayahuasca. Um, so this is a Peruvian film which uh, deals with uh, the titular drug ceremony. Uh, I don't know exactly how you would... Um, the healing property. Uh, usually it's kind of depicted as like ayahuasca will like send you on like a spiritual journey and like kind of get you fucked up but like kind of just like send you like you discover stuff about yourself um from what i can tell and they kind of hyped this up in the back of the cover this was like one of the first like authentic depictions of ayahuasca and kind of its healing properties and what it means to the people who kind of perform this and like lead these ceremonies and stuff but it is a narrative it's not a documentary it involves like um a kind of lower socioeconomic class like woman like sex worker in peru and like this uh researcher who's kind of like visiting the area from lima uh peru um to like kind of like research some of the ceremonies and stuff around these two and like another do kind of go on this journey uh the starting point is this kind of like ayahuasca ceremony but it kind of leads down the like the river and like one of them goes missing and it kind of like it blends between fiction and reality in really interesting ways. And it's like you see people see visions, but you're kind of like wondering what they represent or what like they're kind of getting from these visions and stuff. But overall, it's a very interesting movie. I think it's not super long or anything, but I think it, it handles this material in interesting ways. I think it, um, it's a good snapshot of this culture and kind of what they believe in. Um, even if narratively it kind of, it's not completely like driving the whole time. It's like a little meandering at points and like, it's not meant to be a strict A to B narrative. Um, it kind of takes its time and goes down different avenues, but overall I think it's a worthy watch and an interesting uh, Peruvian effort. Um, in terms of this Blu-ray, um, it comes from a, uh, a 2K or 2K restoration of a 35 millimeter print um, with an English subtitles on it. This is not the most pristine print. And so I want to clarify, this doesn't have like English subtitles manufactured. This is from a print that had English subtitles burned in. So the whole time these are burned in subtitles that were are there no matter what, because that's all they pretty much had to work with. And while this has been restored in 2K, it is a print and there's a lot of damage and variance to it. And a lot of times you'll kind of see like elements of like discoloration or like kind of vinegar syndrome types of things um, going on in different shots. Other other portions of the frame look very nice and like really look clear, but there there's some major damage like that I more so expect with like silent air films, but there is some major damage here that I want to prepare people for. Even though this is a new restoration, there's some pretty significant uh, wear and tear to this is a uh, interview with the director and a, if you're interested in learning more about like different international cinema the wind of ayahuasca it's a pretty interesting one it's not the best thing i've watched this week but if you're intrigued at all about it i think it's worth checking out just to like see how you feel about it yes um i have a very different movie like almost yeah. the exact opposite of that that is Lisa Frankenstein. And I know you were like, why did you request this? You didn't like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, here, hold on. Let me just show you. Like, uh, so this is what the disc is like. It's pink. And that's cute. I like that. Um, So I didn't hate this movie. It has good bones. But I feel like narratively, it's just a little messy 
and I'm really surprised because I like Diablo Cody a lot. I think Jennifer's Body is like one of the most underrated horror movie of like I don't know the last 20 years. Like it's it's so good. Um and I know people that absolutely love this movie and I get it. It just feels like the narrative wasn't that great for me. Like there was like parts where it feels like big chunks of logic and like plot are kind of missing, but it's very derivative of like pick any Tim Burton movie, like, like Beetlejuice is a huge influence on this movie. And like, listen, that's like everything influences everything. I get it. That's par for the course, but it, it, it it's, it's so much so that it doesn't feel like it's its own thing. But having said that, I absolutely love this release. I think that they didn't just dump this movie. Uh, I love gag reels, deleted scenes. There's featurettes. Um, There's some other surprises that I don't want to spoil, but like it's a fantastic release. I just wish I wish I liked the movie more because this is so tailor made for me. My partner and I went to an 80s costume party at the Alamo draft house for this movie. And even in that setting, it was just like, it was, I mean, ironically, it feels like a patchwork um, hmm. and it being like a Frankenstein thing, but like, I don't know. And I don't even like mind like leaps in logic. Like some people had a problem with you randomly have this like tanning bed that re- it, you know can resurrect people that's cute that's kind of funny and quirky like i don't care if that's not realistic but it's it's only when it starts really like the sort of like meat and potatoes of the narrative is is feeling a little bit messy is when i start maybe checking out a little bit but again there's people that love this movie that swear by it i've watched it like twice now and i'm like it's fine I don't absolutely hate it. There are some really funny moments. There is some lines that are hysterical. Like the dialogue, like was especially with some of these kids and stuff is like, oh my God. Like some of it's like, it's a groaner for sure. But like, you also can feel like an a stupid eighties era kid would say something like that. So yeah, I liked it. I love this cast. Everybody does an amazing job acting wise visually this is stunning but again it ha- it just it feels like so burton-esque that it it just almost takes you out of it a little bit see your your dog agrees he's like he's also very upset uh, <laughs> so this has a digital code um when i opened it up uh it didn't have it in there but if you order it it will and uh yeah i would say check it out i mean it didn't connect with me but i know other people like it but this this um is a banger of a release i have to say I, like hats off this is loaded it gives you your bang for your buck i think that's what we need to be doing to like hype up physical media more like you can stream it but you're not going to get all these fun extras so yeah I, i'm glad that got a blu-ray i hope it's one of those universal releases that ends up getting a 4k yeah. but uh as it is i'm glad that um it at least got a Blu-ray for now just to enjoy. And that'll that'll be one that I return to again for the Halloween season. So I'm excited about that. Um, my final title is another from Kino Classics. Um, it was one that really intrigued me because they don't do much in the world of animation, but they, this is one of them. Um, this is The Soldier's Tale, um, which is it's a pretty short film. Um, it's like a little over 50 minutes long, uh, but it's... Uh, it's an interesting one. Um, it's from um, R.O. Blackman, and uh, it involves a soldier who is coming back from the war, um, and he's like going home, and he comes across the devil, and he makes a deal, um, a, like to for like extreme wealth and stuff. But as with all deals with the devil, he comes to regret it and realizes like what he did, like he shouldn't have done, and he tries to kind of fix his problems and there's like he goes on a strange journey and he learns about like different aspects of the world throughout it's just a pretty fantastical journey but overall i really liked it it's a really simple animation style like you can tell like here like these these characters are really like kind of crudely drawn but in a way that's kind of charming 
you can also kind of see here like some of the examples uh here but overall i think this anime i i love animation so much and like all the different things that you can do with it and this is a really interesting one and even though it is kind of on the shorter side i think it tells like a really nice complete story overall and some of the special features kind of put it into more like why would i buy this territory even though i think 50 minutes like that's fine like if it's priced appropriately but um there's some good special features here as well the, fi the film is good um it does come with a commentary track and uh, at the beginning of the commentary track there is a portion where the disc producer chimes in and uh, talks about some stuff i didn't know which is this is like an extended version of the movie that's never been released before because certain sequences at the top have always been excised, but they've been reinstated. So that's interesting. Like if you, even if you've seen this before, you probably haven't seen it like fully uncut, which is cool. Uh, so you get that commentary track. Um, you also get a an additional Christmas like themed short uh, called No Room at the End. It tells the nativity story in kind of like a acerbic, like darkly comedic way, which is pretty fun. It's like 14 minutes long. Um, you also get another collection of just like random like shorts and commercials and stuff that the animator did. It runs about 19 minutes long. And like, there's some really interesting commercial, like there's like an Alka-Seltzer commercial, which is pretty fun, um, but just done like inventive animation that I really like. And then like a trailer, but overall, uh, the Soldier's Tale, uh, this is also, I forgot to say, has a new 2K restoration, but I've talked about animation a lot with uh, Deaf Crocodiles releases and I would say their restoration efforts with like all their overseas people and some of the other domestic stuff. It's a lot better than this one because they have original camera negatives usually to work with. This is from, I believe a personal 35 millimeter copy from the animators collection. So it's like a print of the movie, like similar to uh, the wind of ayahuasca um it's not pristine there's still quite a bit of like nicks and scratches that haven't been able to be completely eradicated but overall it looks pretty nice overall and the sound is pretty good so if you're interested the soldier's tale is pretty solid even if like it would have been nice if the original camera negative still survived but it doesn't seem like it is so it's good for what it can fe feasibly be nice i always love um rescuing these animation uh shorts and features and like more of that please um my final title is one that i was so excited for and i was even more excited when i saw the extras and this also probably makes my short list for my favorite release of this year uh and even um and that's uh tormented a bert i gordon film and look at that beautiful bounty of extras also if you like me uh first i was first acquainted with this movie very well because i this is like one of my all-time favorite mystery science theater episodes um and they were able to license uh the mst3k episode uh oh, cool it's such a, a huge like get because uh that probably couldn't have been like I mean, that definitely was putting some resources into this uh, release. So we also have this booklet that I want to show off really quick. Um, and there's some like really interesting info about the cast, about um, like how you get um, Joe Turkle as a beatnik, which was really fun. Um, I got to meet him, but I unfortunately didn't have a lot of time to talk to him. And I always wish I could have talked to him more about this movie. Um, but yeah, it's it's a really nice booklet. Um, kind of like, like what you were saying, like maybe uh, some later pressings might have this. So you want to order it while you can. As far as the movie goes, it is very cheesy. If you like Burt I. Gordon movies, you know what you're in for um like the dialogue is clunky like the effects are really hokey but um i think this one might be one of my favorite bird eye cord movies it's i like the idea of this guy going insane and it sort of plays on it, it could do this more but it's it, 
it plays on is he crazy is he really being haunted um he plays this like jazz musician who is set to marry this like wealthy woman but he's having this affair um and he she ends up like he's lives in this lighthouse and she falls uh from like the like side but he like decides not to like rescue her so she falls to her death and she's like haunting him but at first it sort of plays on is he crazy is she really haunting him i mean you do get a definitive answer like not that long into the movie but it's a good one. I mean, I'm partial to the MST3K version of it because it is kind of a bad movie, but it is really fun. The commentary track is baller on this. Um, the um, We have some like visual essays, some featurettes. They do a really fun thing uh, where they uh, re-edit a trailer for this uh, for like this 2024 release, which is fun. No, it's just, it really has, like, everything going for it. And um, if you like these old school, um, I was going to say 50s horror movies, but this is te technically 1960. Uh, but if you like these 50s, 60s kind of, like, spook fests, uh, it's really fantastic. I also wanted to mention there is a um, really fantastic Burt I. Gordon documentary that is substantial and really well done. Um, and yeah this just has everything you want in a release i just i love it this is like one of my all-time favorites of the year so far so i wanted to end on that wanted to end on a really good note i hope people keep buying these releases i hope they keep putting them out um again them having the mst3k episode on it is so fantastic like that alone i feel like is worth the release but Oh, and I didn't talk about how it looks. I mean, I've always only ever seen these in like really bargain basement um, prints. So seeing this in a really nice cleaned up print is really fantastic. It's not flawless. You can tell that like some of the original material maybe wasn't taken that good of care of, but like really a huge step up from what I'm used to seeing. And of course, like the MST3K version of this like you can kind of see how the old school print looked and it's like not good <laughs> um so i feel like it helps you appreciate that more but yeah this is a fantastic release i had such a fun time delving into all all the uh, special features and stuff so if you're a fan please get this support them it's really amazing um, yeah that one seems interesting uh i I trust uh, the film masters, like everything they've released so far have been really good quality. Even if some of the movies have been like, oh, I'm not sure. I usually like the special features make me yeah. appreciate something about the movie. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to checking that one out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like the movie is so, so it is fun. You have to be sort of, you really have to be a devotee of like these like cheesy bird eye Gordon movies, but they just hit really it, it's just like a kind of filmmaking that they don't really make anymore it's it's so earnest and wanting to tell a spooky story about a disembodied head haunting uh richard carlson so it's fun mm. so uh with that uh that is our episode and as always um please give this video a like subscribe all that great stuff we want to hear from you please weigh in in the comments what you think of like what, what we've covered even like what some releases that are uh pretty recent releases that maybe wasn't on our radar because i always like to hear about that kind of stuff too and um as always um thank you for hanging out with us